Good evening, everyone. Uh, I have to say it's been a it's been a long time since we've had a major event on campus. We've been downtown for the last five years, and it's it's kind of nice to be up here. And it's also interesting to see this is why we have a bigger space downtown because when it's a popular lecture and a popular person, we have standing room only. So um, welcome. My name is John Brown. I'm the dean of the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape, and I am thrilled to be here this evening to host this important event. Um, as you know, we always start with a land acknowledgement, and I would say that tonight, given the topic, given the individual that is giving the lecture, that that land acknowledgement is particularly poignant. Um, we, we, we are all just coming to terms with what it means to be uninvited guests on the land in which we have lived. Uh, for our lives, but uh, where where others, the, the indigenous peoples, have lived for many, many, uh, many. And I think that, uh, you know, that it's easy to say the words, but I, it's much more important to, uh, to have a kind of acknowledgement in your heart about what this all means. And, and I would say not to, not, to get, not to get too deep, too fast, and, and steal what Mary Ellen has to say, but for we have the pleasure of, of hearing the, the words of someone who has spent their life on this land and a great deal of time working with the indigenous peoples. And, and I think that that's, that's an important part of our reconciliation and the way in which we come to terms with all of this. And, and it's really an honor to, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to do this this evening. So the University of Calgary, both here and, and downtown, is located in the heart of Southern Alberta, which as we know is the, is the land of the people of Treaty 7. And we, may, we acknowledge and contribute to those people, both past and present, who have stewarded this land for many, many generations. Uh, I think that notion of stewardship is, is essential, not only, well, primarily to landscape architecture, I suppose that's kind of the heart and soul of the profession, but I would say by extension in planning and landscape and to architecture and just the whole notion of the constructed environment, both natural and, and, uh, and built. And uh, of course, the peoples of Treaty 7 includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, which comprises the Siksiki, the Makana, and the Dainai First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, which includes the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Goodstone First Nations, and that the city of Calgary is also home to the Metis Nation of Alberta Districts 5 and 6. So uh, before I introduce the, uh, the, the main event, so to speak, um, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Sheila Miller, who is the executive director of the Faculty Association, to uh, to say a few words. Thank Sheila. You. Thank you, John. Not going to hold you up for very long. I hope you can hear me okay. I just I, I know Mary Ellen is here for what she needs to say today, but I think for any of you who are academic staff. You need to know that she's been an officer of the Faculty Association for two decades. She's been an officer at large. She's been vice president and treasurer. And most notably to me, she's been grievance advisor. <laughs> that means she deals with all the problems that uh, people have across campus. And I can't tell you the stories because they're very confidential. But I can't tell you one, and I'll bet Mary Ellen knows what I'm going to say. <laughs> There was uh, one meeting we had with a very uh, problematic member. Most of our members are not problematic, but we do have the occasional ones that are. And he was just really very aggressive with me. And I guess Mary Ellen felt I couldn't defend myself. I don't know. She crawled across the table. <laughs> this very gentle woman crawled across the table. I had our lawyer with us who had to stop her from <laughs> attacking this member. So um, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Anyway, I'm not going to say any more. I just wanted you all to know that she has worked for the academic staff, not just in Sapo, but clearly members all across campus for two decades. And Mary Ellen, I'm going to miss you. You're the best grievance advisor I've ever had.
those SAPL faculty, faculty members in the room know it's not that uncommon for Mary Ellen to grab a to, to scrabble across the table during a faculty council meeting, particularly when there's something important like the architects are trying to do something that they shouldn't be doing. All of that kind of thing, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so Mary Ellen has been with our involved with the University of Calgary and our school for over 50 years, first as a student and then coming back as dean and then serving the faculty since uh, after that for, for gosh, came in 1998, I don't I can't even remember. That's like 35 years. <laughs> so a massive amount of time as student and as dean and as faculty member, as leader, as mentor, as friend, as scholar, uh, I can go on and on. Um, the, the impact that she has had in shaping this school is profound, absolutely profound. And, and I've been talking to people over the last few days, and tonight, is this still on? Yeah, there. Sometimes. I've been talking to people over the last few days, and, um, and we're quite, not quite sure what we're going to do tomorrow when, when, we, when, when, when Mary Ellen is not in the halls and not, um, not, not able to uh, provide insight and um, consolation and uh, a, friendly, a friendly shoulder to cry on and, and, and also just a huge amount of intellectual curiosity and depth and, in, and, and, uh, and inquiry that has defined your, your career. In terms of the, the, um, some of the accolades, uh, Mary Ellen did serve as Dean of the Faculty of Environmental Design in 1998 for a term and then she stepped in twice since that time as Associate Dean for Planning and Landscape. Uh, once while I was Dean and it was, it was absolutely incredible and you've been such an important um, mentor to me over the years. Uh, in 2018 she was recognized with the Order of the University of Calgary and an honorary member of the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects for Lifetime Achievement in 2016. Mary Ellen has been a tenured faculty member at three Canadian universities over the past 45 years and prior to that worked in both the private and public sector positions related to landscape architecture and environmental planning nationally and internationally. And wait, there's more. She's also an accomplished artist as most of us in the room discovered tonight. <laughs> We're just wondering, are those going to be for sale? Because there's a few of us that have got like, hmm, I like that one. So this, this could be a way of topping up your retirement here. So. Anyways, with no further ado, I am going to pass the room over to the guest of honor, Dr. Mary Ellen Tyre. Bye. <laughs> This is uh, not a room I lecture in, so I'm just hoping, can you hear me? All right, thank you. Um, first of all, I guess based on Sheila's story and to John, if I consider this my family, so if anyone attacks my family, you gotta go through me first. <laughs> so, a little exaggerated, but you know, but it, it's true that uh, I hope that those of you who know me here know I'm always there for you if you need me. So first, I, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming to this event. Uh, your attendance is especially noble, as this is billed as the last lecture, which, given the academic context, sounds deadly, <laughs> boring, <laughs> and long. <laughs> However, may I assure you that it won't be too long, and the bar is open. <laughs> However, before I begin tonight's uh, presentation, I need to formally recognize two special friends, Sam Gaynor and John Bauman, who I hope will stand up and take a bow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, luckily for me, and hopefully for us tonight, um, the writers and producers and actor strike in Hollywood meant these two talented production geniuses we're not working. <laughs> and when I told them what I was thinking about doing, they leaped in with a moment's hesitation and just did this. Um, I am in awe, so thank you so much. And I also want to thank the gallery installation crew volunteers, SAPL MLE Professor Chris Fox, 
and SAPL MLA alumni, Justin Batia, Jennifer Coppy, and uh, Lindy Pruitt, who gave up their Saturday to come and help put this all up for you. So again, it's one of those things, you don't get anywhere without friends and support. And I've been very lucky to have all of it in my career here. Uh, as you know, uh, retirement is one of life's uh, milestones. And as such, colleagues, friends, family members, and former students, uh, many of you are, who, who are here tonight have kindly reached out with congratulations and good wishes. Uh, regrettably, my sister and brother-in-law in Manitoba could not be here tonight because they're moving house, but they sent me a card that I want to share with you. It is a reminder of how important family is at times like this. <laughs> so obviously you don't know my sister and brother-in-law. Uh, this is pretty uh, indicative of how sentimental and loving my family is. And there's a there's some truth to this after hearing Sheila's story. <laughs> the night's still young. Yeah, exactly. There's work to do. Um, so let me see if we can, yeah. Some of you have been asking, uh, you know, how I've been doing since uh, since I retired. And, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, the last couple of weeks have been pretty grim. So I've, uh, you know, I, I've been keeping a retirement log uh, just to uh, you know, kind of keep track of my time. And uh, in that 45 wind chill, I must admit that with the wine supply depleted, the candy dwindling, I was forced to put on real clothes an exit base and morale was low. So I managed to revive myself in time to, uh, to come back to, uh, to, to this uh, evening tonight. And uh, the talk will be, is not a slideshow talk, but it will be illustrated with some of my photographs that kind of complement hopefully what's in the gallery. Um, I, I have been spending the last few years of my academic career working with 20 year olds, which has kept me young. But I have recently begun to appreciate that there may be some advantages of being over 70. For example, there is very little left to learn the hard way. Uh, <laughs> the things I buy won't wear out. <laughs> it's my cardiologist telling me to slow down, not the police. <laughs> the number of functioning brain cells I have are down to a manageable number. And finally, my secrets are safe because none of my friends remember them either. <laughs> now, most of you uh, here tonight have known me uh, from the last 25 years in my role as, the, as a U of C professor. However, I've actually had a number of careers before turning to academia, which I don't think many of you are familiar with. Shark wrestler, <laughs> rodeo rider, <laughs> Stanley Cup winner, <laughs> astronaut, <laughs> and dinosaur hunter. But I gave it all up 25 years ago to come to the U of C uh, faculty as dean. There I am. And Yes, I, this is my circus. Um, I, they are my monkeys and I know who the clowns are. <laughs> so with that uh, semi-amusing beginning, I want to uh, take this opportunity to plunge into um, my, my, uh, my presentation. But first I wanna say that obviously, the last 25 years at SAPL is going to be very, very difficult to forget. Uh, but I want to assure you that I have started therapy and I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Since arriving in Calgary 25 years ago, uh, as the dean of the school, when the faculty was called environmental design, I have spent most Saturdays taking a drive to explore the back roads in the country landscapes outside of Calgary. This process of solitary exploration didn't just start in Calgary, but has been something that I have done most of my life, regardless of where I lived. The origins of such drives began in childhood at the ripe old age of four, when I accompanied my dad 
on weekly seasonal drives to check on the cabin at the lake, to deliver hail insurance policies in small town Manitoba farms, and to scout for ducks and geese before hunting season began. Once I could drive, I continued these weekly outings wherever I lived. 50 years ago, these drives began to involve taking photographs. And 25 years ago, they started to involve sketching and a little plein air painting, weather permitting. When I made it official that I was going to retire at the end of 2023, friends asked me what I planned to do when I retired. Without hesitation, I replied, go out for drives in the country and take photos and paint. This statement was an epiphany for me as I realized that although I had done these weekly drives most of my life and clearly intended just to do more, I had never thought seriously about why this activity was so compelling to me, what I am actually doing, what does it mean, and why does it matter? <laughs> For most of us, driving is just part of our daily activities, especially if you live in Calgary. We see, see urban, rural, suburban landscapes as we drive through them, but what are we seeing in them? Perhaps, as Niccolo Sotorio suggests, we experience them without acknowledging them. As such, we are disconnected from the landscape experience. It is only an externality to us in which we are the uninvolved third party. So as a retiring professor of landscape architecture and planning, I have decided to use some of my photographs and paintings from the last 25 years of driving around the Calgary region as a way of thinking about images and what they represent through my experience of creating them. Given the phenomenal growth and change in the Calgary region over the last 25 years, many, if not most, of the places I initially recorded no longer exist. As such, and without realizing it, at the time, my plein air field studies recorded and celebrated vanishing regional cultural landscapes in real time. Intellectually, everyone accepts change as a constant condition. Change is also cumulative, incremental, and experiential. Kispum and Saltzman use the term ephemeral to describe short-lived temporary landscapes in the urban rural fringe. Such ephemeral landscapes represent transitional stages of change between rural and urban landscapes and can exist in an indefinite state of limbo for days, months, years before they disappear into new development. These transitional landscapes are seldom studied, although they play an important role in the experience of landscape. The qualities of ephemeral or temporal landscapes during the process of transformation are generally not considered important. However, it is these transient landscapes and momentary experiences in the rural urban fringe that are the subject of this presentation and gallery show. Given that ephemeral or transitional landscapes are seldom studied, the question I began to explore became what landscape concepts and doing, uh, sorry, and conceptual frameworks are useful for thinking about cultural landscape change. In considering this question and doing some literature searching, there were four thematic areas that helped shape my approach to this question, which are described below. Landscape as concept and construct, landscape as identity, landscape as place, and landscape as change. The first theme, landscape as concept and construct. It's important to go back to basics and identify an operational way of thinking about landscape. The English word landscape is believed to be of Dutch origin with the word landschap and meaning a painted view, usually of rural surroundings. Hirsch describes the concept of landscape as representing a range of culturally specific assumptions specific to the modern West, including its visual, involves a viewer and a view, has an aesthetic value and embodies a picturesque form, 
is rural and to do with nature rather than with people and urbanized surroundings. James Corner, an American landscape architect, writing almost 40 years ago, offered the view that the medium of landscape is not given, but produced. It is not of nature, but of fiction. It is this cultural process, Corner argues, that differentiates the landscape from the word land. Landscape is a construction, a representation, a complex of schemata and ideas that inform a people's perception of their environment and affects how they act. Both Hirsch and Corner's views of landscape as cultural concept and construct represent a fundamental theme of this gallery show. Specifically, the medium of landscape is represented by the medium of painting. The landscape images produced are works of fiction in that art is fictive, representation of time, places, and experience. It involves a viewer and a view, but an emotional aesthetic and deals with rural places rather than people in urban surroundings. Landscape identity, theme two, the landscape may have been initially viewed as an inert backdrop, but by the early 1970s, anthropologists recognized that people do not just live in landscapes, but also through them. Landscape is an intrinsic part of, or even actor in human social and cultural lives, constructed by them both physically and symbolically and reciprocally, helping to make and unmake relationships and identities. Landscape features in the narratives we make about ourselves help us to understand who we are individually and collectively. We experience being attached emotionally to places and landscapes, and perhaps they become attached to us. Perhaps this is why the loss of the places and landscapes that we are attached to and that are attached to us continues to have such a significant emotional and cultural impact. It is difficult to process, hard to express, and impossible for those who were never part of this experience to understand it. This is a part of what I think when I first came to Calgary was considered the ranching cowboy identity. And it was old when I came here 25 years ago. Um, this wonderful building and what it represented in its time has been replaced by this a Korean Buddhist temple on the same location. But before the barn, there was this on the same location. So yes, our experiences, our identity of who we are and place change over time. The meaning of that and what's important about that is that the landscapes that I grew up with and have lived with have indeed played a strong role in shaping my worldview and identity, both personally and professionally. They have led me to study, let, they have led me to a land centric value system, a life of study and practice in applied environmental science, ecological planning, and landscape architecture. Originally a prairie kid, I have, I have become attached to the landscape of Southern Alberta, and it has become attached to me. The gallery show represents a selection of artifacts created through the process of attachment over the last 25 years. The third theme of landscape is place. Similar to the theme of landscape and identity, the concept of place or sense of place generally refers to the experience of specific locations and geographic scales. Authentic places are recognized as having character, heritage, and a uniqueness that makes them feel memorable and one of a kind. Basso suggests great places, and therefore great placemaking, should animate the ideas and feelings of persons who experience them, and in turn, those ideas and feelings should animate those places. In this context, landscape as place can generate its own meaning. Professional academic design programs frequently instruct students 
in design studio and design theory that one of the most important intentions or goals of landscape architecture, urban design, and community planning is placemaking, and preferably great placemaking. Given that I have spent the last 35 years providing design studio instruction at three Canadian universities, I can personally vouch for this. However, a review of the professional and academic literature suggests placemaking is focused on urban public realm in the context of greenfield development or in urban redevelopment. A further sampling of this literature identifies a frequent formulaic approach in physical form making, including checklists and talking to different project stakeholders to identify what specific functional and social needs of the existing space need to be accounted for. While these are relative and well-practiced approaches, over the last 25 years, my weekly backroads and drives have made me question what an appropriate pedagogy for teaching landscape placemaking should be. Specifically, I worry there is little opportunity or time for students to directly engage with authentic landscapes and places to enable them from direct experience to develop a personal and emotional connection from which to draw on and inform their design process. Without this opportunity, do they instead become dependent on checklists, formulized formulaic generalizations and the opinion of others, informed or otherwise, as the guide to creative thinking? <laughs> Landscape in this context rapidly becomes the other and placemaking does not become animated by the ideas and feelings drawn from the experience of the designers. How do we, as designers, create home place? If we had not personally experienced and explored its meaning and expression physically, emotionally, and imaginatively, even though a modest, unpublished, unfunded, and unrecognized approach, my weekly drives Paintings and photography have been my way of experiencing landscape as place and finding and exploring my home place. Over the years, I have used the information gathered from these weekly drives to inform my teaching and pedagogy of placemaking. And I have tried as much as possible to take students into the field to experience place. Man, some days cold, some days. <laughs> Theme four, landscape is change. At the end of the 1980s, Pierre Nora suggested that loss of place and dislocation makes people more, not less conscious of places as repositories for belonging and meaning. Nora's context for this statement was contemporary modernity in which individual and collective experience of and relationships with time, space, and place are transformed and unsettled by increasingly powerful universal technologies that render people and identities to be displaced and delocalized. Similarly, Congrove Kong and Daniels concluded from their work that in the, their work in the iconography of landscape, from a postmodern perspective, landscape seems less like a palimist whose real or authentic meanings can somehow be recovered through correct techniques, theories, and ideologies, and more like a flickering text displayed on a screen whose meaning can be created, extended, altered, elaborated, and finally obliterated by the merest touch of a button. The title of Marshall Berman's 1982 book on postmodernity is all that is solid melts into air. I find this phrase to be richly descriptive of the vanishing cultural landscapes of Calgary's urban, urban fringe over the last 25 years. It has been interpreted by scholars of Berman's work as a reference to the ephemeral nature of life, as in life is a vapor unable to be grasped. Since 2007, I have carried around a quote from architect 
Olafur Eliasson's paper, Models Are Real, which says, space does not just exist in time, it is of time. Doing this gallery show has made me appreciate the profoundness of this observation. Experiencing ephemeral landscape and exploring them through plein air painting has provided me with a way of understanding place in a changing world and in a changing life. Hopefully, the work on display is a fitting homage to their existence because the last 20 years of my life has vanished right along with them. <laughs> In the process of putting together this show, I have come to understand my weekly drives as a way of learning about identity, home place, and change through the medium of ephemeral landscapes in the urban rural fringe. The paintings and photography that you are tonight seeing tonight represent my field notes from these journeys. The intention of this largest lecture is to change your perception of the work you see in the gallery. It is not simply bad art. <laughs> and, it is definitely, <laughs> and it is most definitely not fine art for sale. <laughs> Rather, it is a record of representational flashes of insight into a temporal phenomena and a fictive construct of place and identity. I hope by changing your perception of what we are seeing, you will begin to see these images as you would an old friend. And as you look further, that you will see in them a part of who I am. Perhaps something that hasn't been obvious in my day-to-day -day university role as an administrator and professor for the last 25 years. Thank you for joining me tonight on a virtual drive through the back roads of Alberta. Extinct and loving it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have a couple of minutes. There's something happening, but we need a couple more minutes. So we're going to have, we're going to have a Q&A. Uh, those of you that are outside and those in the other room, stay there for a few more minutes. But when I give you the signal, you should all come into this room. We'll all stand up and make some room because we're going to have a toast. Uh, but that was the surprises. Well, that's one of the surprises at the toast. But so just so that everybody knows what's happening, but we'll, we'll take a couple of minutes to uh, if someone, you can either ask a question or if you'd just like to say something nasty or nice uh, to Mary Ellen, um, please. Who would like to, who would like to, uh, to make a comment? The fewer four letter words, the better. <laughs> Anybody? Yes. I'll start. Uh, I'll start. Oh, I didn't see you. Uh, I say thank you. Um, I mean, I'll speak for myself, I might be speaking for a few of us here that some were from Alberta with friends of mine next to me, uh, others became from other parts of the world, the continent, and you were one of our first instructors, and one of the first people to start opening our eyes to what was out there in this new place, and the, the way we view stuff, the way we view the places, and the way we now approach our work every day and on the weekends, has been really influenced by what you can find. So thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> I can take it after 25 years. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I've known Mary Allen a little longer than that. Mary and I, and my wife Mary, we were students. Environmental design in 1975, and um, 
Mary Ellen is one of the, um, we've maintained a, a acquaintance and friendship over the years so that, that that initial group of students that came in terms of that, uh, uh, I don't know what your grievance. I went, <laughs> I, I didn't finish my work in their policy analysis. I went into human resources, but I, I settled a lot of grievances in my time too. But Mary Ellen, you brought me back 50 years with your, with your, uh, uh, lecture in, in terms of the concepts and that and being uh, a fellow very kid from Manitoba. I really appreciate it and I grew to, grew to uh, understand and what you were talking about growing up as a kid on Manitoba and Price. So Mary Ellen, welcome to the retirement club. Mary and I are both there now. But, uh, yeah, I it's know you were a wonderful thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, we're late, isn't it, that we're, yeah. we were still young around and yeah, we were we're young still then. keeping together. And I hope most of the students here will do exactly that as well. Yeah. It's a wonderful experience. I have a question. Yes, of course. Has anyone, when you're stopping to take pictures or paint out there, has anyone come up to you? Have there been other people that have come up and been like, hey, what are you doing? Or, yeah, my, my most famous memory, I, I really thought I was in the middle of nowhere. And it was 103 degrees. And this plenary painting, you're up for a couple of hours, and it's pretty quick sketching. So I was, I had parked the car off, and I was sitting in the ditch, you know, with my, my easel and the thing. And, and no, it wasn't a car for hours. And then the US Postal Service, <laughs> it was just across the border in Montana, came down, came to a screeching all, yells out, What the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> You're so focused. You just, everything else goes away. And then he said, I'll be back. So I guess he went down to the end of the road and made deliveries and came back. And then he came by and he said, that looks beautiful. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, that was really the, the non-human interaction. Was, it, was, it was a hot, another hot morning. And I think it was probably about late July in Fish Creek, Pioneer. And there was a little, you know, and wetland and some Tom Thompson trees and, and I'm concentrating because the light moves so fast when you're doing plein air. It's never the same picture 10 seconds later. So I'm viciously trying to get all this down and I hear this point and all of a sudden I hear this right beside my ear and I thought, someone's breathing in my ear. <laughs> and I turned around and there was a deer peering. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of went, okay, if it's okay with you, it's okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Sorry, I, I think there was another question. Yes. Very quick. Sure. Um, Mary Ellen, I uh, just want to thank you on behalf of a lot of my colleagues in landscape architecture and the professionals now. I took a course from you in 1992. It was the hardest undergrad course I took. But, uh, it was inspirational, and I think to this day it's one of the uh, courses we talk about most amongst my colleagues and I. Um, but uh, really, it was an inspiration and uh, has influenced my career and many other professional yeah, landscape you. architects. So thank, thank you, George. You. That was at University of Manitoba. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if, if I can get everybody from the other rooms to come into the room, there we're distributing some some sparkly oh, things. We got flowers. Did you want to say something, Enrico? That's gorgeous. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing to say. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say one more thank you for the party stars. Oh. I have never shown my art publicly before. Oh, yeah. And so tonight I was so scared <laughs> what about, what about people seeing my art because in my mind it's fridge art, the kind of stuff when you're great by, you take home and your mom sticks them in the fridge. <laughs> but you know, I thank you, you've been so kind, and I just hope that between the talk and that the images start to make sense. So thank you so much. There is some where it's coming. I think there was a crash, but there is. <laughs> this is so kind. Thank you. I hope everyone is.
Mariela, no. we also have a question from Alex. Uh, Alex Azzola, sorry. I, I don't oh, know yes, that. Alex, of course. Um, so he asked if authenticity can be derived from, from landscape at the intersection of personal subjectivity or memory, time, and place. How do we reconcile the group concept of authenticity? Authentic, sorry, I can't say that. Um, and how can we, how can things feel authentic? Is this a kind of a shared mirage? Uh, oh, wow. No, I think it's like, yeah. it's not, I mean, it's been, you can't believe the amount of literature and years that people have put into trying to understand the meaning of landscape and cultural landscape. I don't think it is a shared mirage. Um, certainly, I think parts of um, modernism, where everything looks the same, is a shared mirage. But real landscape isn't. Real landscape is, it's authentic because it's about who we are, what we do on that landscape, and what it means to us. And, and I think the big difference was, of course, and John alluded to this initially, the first peoples, they were, the land and the people were one. They never separated. They, every, every flower, every grass, every animal, there was energy, power, knowledge, and, and like, it was a whole ecosystem of relationships that they fostered and enabled them to survive. And since industrialization, we seem to have forgotten that we're biological creatures. <laughs> And that we need clean air, clean water, food, energy, soil, all of those, and, our, and all our relations to survive. So I think the, the real authentic part of it is when we're able to step away, and not that technology is a bad thing, but we're able to step away and experience being human in that biological sense. It comes from the heart, I guess. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, thanks, Alex. So I, I know some of you have have a glass. The rest are coming, but I think I think given the temper, rising temperature of the room, <laughs> we should uh, we should oh no just a second there's a couple there's a couple of glasses there. Anyways, we will start. So there is a tradition in Sapple that started about six months ago when another one of our faculty <laughs> retired uh, of having a toast, and and we thought that that was a, just a fitting way to say thank you to a colleague. Thank you. So, hip hip hooray, hip hip hooray, hip hip hooray, Mary Ellen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, I couldn't have had 25 better years of memories. <laughs> Now we can go out and have a little bit more. I think the bar is open, but there is.